one of Brooklyn's residential areas. A boy is running with his friend as two other boys are waiting for them with a gun near the containers. They head to a playground where some guys are playing basketball. The boys offer the youngest one to kill one of the gang members. He comes closer, aims the gun, and starts firing. Fortunately, no one is hurt. Everyone runs away, including the boys who came with him. The boy sees this, throws the gun away, and flees. The juvenile delinquent comes home as if nothing has happened, takes out a can of soda, watches some TV, and goes to his room to feed the pigeons that he keeps in a makeshift cage. In the near future, this boy is going to be detained multiple times for drinking in a public place, misdemeanor, fights, theft, and robbery, which will get him a sentence in a juvenile detention facility in New York. A few years later, two young coaches, Teddy and Kevin, ask an elderly colleague who has raised several boxing champions to try out a guy who they were introduced to recently. He has a criminal record and 40 arrests. The coach is shocked and says, Even Al Capone wasn't arrested no 40 times. But he still goes to see the guy who was disowned even by his own mother. The coach sees a strong 14-year-old with an incredibly powerful punch, but no technique or style. Kevin says he thought the guy was thin and skinny. Being surprised, they ask the sparring coach what he's been feeding him. He says cola and steroids as usual. The elderly coach asks what the guy's name is. He answers, Mike. Costamato asks for his full name. Mike Tyson. The coach takes Mike to his house. The boy will live with him now. At home, Cuss introduces Mike to Camille, the woman of the house. She is originally from Ukraine. Of course, she's not very happy because this is yet another person to feed, but there's no way out. Cuss says that they could use the extra $200 which they will get for fostering Mike. Cuss shows Mike his room and tells him the house rules. The main one is to keep it clean. He finds an empty ice cream can and screams angrily asking who has eaten his ice cream. He then warns Mike to never eat his ice cream. Mike sticks to a sports routine, getting up at 4 a.m., jogging and training. The coach helps him set his mind on winning by giving him motivating statements and telling various interesting stories. Videos with the greatest fighters, including Muhammad Ali, come in handy too. Young Mike enjoys watching and learning every move. His eyes are full of passion. Together with the coach, they analyze the fights of Rocky Marciano. Cuss says that strength is not the only important thing, but also morale. Rocky never knew what defeat was. The concept of defeat just didn't fit in his brain. Cuz spends all his time with Tyson and uses his wise and meaningful speeches to shape the boy's life goal to become a champion. During the workouts, Mike hones his technique and style. Cuz teaches him the right moves and that speed and tactics are important. He tells Mike not to stand still to always be on the move and to deceive the opponent with his maneuvers. Mike's daily life goes on in between training sessions. In the new family, he celebrates his birthday and eats the coach's ice cream. Who ate my ice cream? But is never caught red-handed. Mike learns that his mother has died. He goes to Brooklyn for the funeral. Back at the house, he approaches his pigeons to feed them. After a while, he decides to take them to the coach's house. The coach wants to support Mike, so explains that a professional athlete is a person who goes out to fight regardless of how he feels. He gives him the pendant that Muhammad Ali once gave Cus. He wants Mike to take it with him to the Junior Olympics. Mike's eyes immediately light up. 1982, Colorado Junior Olympics. This is Mike's first competition. He's very worried, nervous, and thinks that he cannot handle it. But thanks to Teddy Atlas's support, Mike deals with his emotions and goes out to fight. Eight seconds are enough for him to knock out the opponent. This is a win, Teddy informs Cuss. Hey, what do you mean eight? You know they only do three rounds in the junior. No, no, eight seconds. Cuss says in bewilderment, What do you do, shoot the guy? Headhunters have gathered around Mike, ready to take the young prodigy under their wing. Cuss tells Teddy not to let Mike talk to anyone and to bring him home at any cost. He tells Camille that since Mike no longer has a mother, they should adopt him. Upon arrival home, Mike brags about the victory to the coach. Cuz jokingly asks him, Eight seconds? What took you so long? Then he admits that he is very proud of him and talks about adoption. Mike agrees, and Camille supports him. Mike would like to call her mom, which makes the woman truly happy. Sitting on the stairs of the house, Mike sees Jim Jacobs and Bill Clayton come to see the coach. These are the managers whom Cuss trusts very much. Mike involuntarily overhears that they are talking about him. The coach prophesies him a heavyweight championship and a place in the Hall of Fame along with Rocky Marciano. Camille notices Mike and asks what he's doing there. 
The coach invites Mike to meet them. He calls them his friends who can keep Mike out of trouble in the scamming business of boxing. Mike is in the car with his friend Rory Holloway. They talk about the future championship. As they're driving, they see two girls on the street, and Mike decides to introduce himself, but the girls do not respond and run away. Mike enters the store mistakenly thinking that they are hiding in a room there. The saleswoman calls the police. Mike gets furious and smashes one of the shop windows. His friend has to pull him out of the store by force. They hear the sounds of the approaching police sirens and quickly disappear. Mike does not attend his workout the next day, and this is not the first time he does so. Teddy is indignant, saying that when Mike screws up, he immediately disappears for three or four days, and this has already become a regular pattern. Cuss is calm. He is sure that Mike just needs to have the right people around him to win the coming championship. Teddy complains that he sleeps with all the women in the neighborhood. One day it is his underage classmate, and the other day it is his teacher. Teddy's 11-year-old sister comes to visit him. When he goes downstairs to meet her, he finds out that Mike touched her buttocks. Teddy is angry and threatens to kill him. God damn it! Son of a bitch! I'm gonna kill that motherfucker! Mike finally comes home. Teddy approaches him and puts a gun to his cheek, accusing him of molesting his younger sister, Jamie. But Mike says it was Jamie who was flirting with him. Mike says that he's not afraid and Teddy shoots at a tree at the level of Mike's head. After this incident, Cuss kicks Teddy out of the training camp. Mike mockingly blows him a kiss. Cuss has to find a new coach. It is Kevin Rooney who looks like Agent Coulson. Mike wins yet another fight. Fight after fight, he knocks his opponents out. Newspapers start writing about him. Mike Tyson's world tour begins. Respect for Tyson is growing exponentially. During one of the fights, Cuss falls ill and is urgently hospitalized. Mike rushes to the hospital and asks him not to die. Mike says Cuss must recover because he cannot live without him, because Cuss always keeps him from messing up. Cuss instructs Mike and tells him to go on fighting, because if Mike screws it up, the coach will return from the dead and whip his ass. Mike cries and rests his head on the coach's chest. After Cuss's death, Mike releases his pigeons into the wild. With tears in his eyes, he complains to Jim that he misses Cuss so much. Mike does not understand what Cuss saw on him and why he loved him. Jimmy replies, Courage, heart, and you got a fist like bowling balls. He reassures the young man that Mike can rely on him, and they share a hug. Las Vegas, 1986. The fight between Tyson and Burbick is going to determine who will become the heavyweight champion of the world. Mike went into this fight with particular fury, wishing to take revenge on Burbick for his exceptional effort in the farewell fight with Muhammad Ali, although he knew that Ali was already suffering from his illness at that time. This fight gets dubbed Judgment Day. Mike becomes the youngest champion in this category. He is only 20 years old. A new era of boxing has begun. Mike and Kevin watch their next opponent on TV. Kevin explains the opponent's tactics, but Mike switches to another channel. Kevin wants to take the remote and gets punched in the jaw. He gets angry and leaves, and Mike watches a TV show about a famous diva, model Robin Givens. Jimmy arrives and invites Mike for a talk. They chat, and Mike says he wants to fall in love and have kids like Jim himself. Oh, yo, Jimmy, man. I showed the most beautiful girl today. I mean, she was smart, elegant. Been thinking about it, man. She got my heart. I think her name was Robin. She from around here? No, I saw her on television. Television? <laughs> Mike calls Robin on the phone rehearsing the conversation in the meantime, but hangs up as soon as he hears the female voice. Hello? He calls her again, this time not without hesitation. He does decide to have a conversation with the beauty. She is surprised by his call. By this time, she has already heard enough about him. Mike asks her out. Robin comes to his fight against Tucker in Las Vegas. During the fight, Mike misses a lot of punches. During the break, instead of listening to the coach, he looks at beautiful Robin. Kevin decides to cheer him up and says, Hey, you know what's going to happen if you lose out there tonight? That little girlfriend of yours is going to go home with fuckhead over there. She's going to do all kinds of nasty things to him all night long. And do you know why? Because she's here for you. Because she's here for the champ. She ain't here for Iron Mikey. And she don't care what the fuck his name is, so long as people call him champ. This winds Mike up, and he wins again. After the fight, Mike and Robin ride in a limousine. He calls her his queen. Robin asks, Queen for a day? Always. Oh, Few months later, Mike calls Camille and tells her that he and Robin got married. She is three months pregnant. 
Camille is so excited that she can't say anything. His manager, Bill, takes the receiver and says that Jimmy Jacobs died of leukemia and will be buried in California. They need to fly out there. At the airport, Mike, Kevin, Bill, and Lauren, Jimmy's wife, are waiting for a limousine, which for some reason does not arrive for a long time. Bill complains to the wife of the deceased man that Robin stormed into the office immediately after his partner's death and said she would manage all her husband's financial affairs. Finally, Don King's limousine arrives. The cunning promoter has been trying to get Tyson for a long time. He remarks that when he worked with Muhammad Ali, he never had to wait for his limousine. He invites Mike to his car, and Mike agrees. Billy realizes that Don King arranged for their limousine to be delayed. Of course, the sharks of the boxing business need only a few minutes to skillfully make the victim listen to them. In the limousine, Don questions Mike's trust in Bill, the second manager, and what his share is. After learning about the 30% share that goes to Bill, Don offers Mike five easy fights worth up to five million each. Mike replies that he will think about it. During the funeral, Bill asks Mike what Don promised him. Mike talks about King's offer, but lies to Bill that he immediately rejected his offer. Mike breaks down and leaves the ceremony, his eyes all full of tears. Kevin approaches him with questions about how he feels. Mike is very upset, though he now had money in his life, he started losing people he could trust. When there was no money, everything was completely different. Kevin asks about his trust in Bill and Robin. Mike says, See, I love Robin with all my heart, man, but love and trust is different things. Next, there's a series of fights and performances by Mike. His wife is insisting on replacing Bill and managing Mike's finances. In addition to other problems, Bill is attacked by Don King, who states that Mike is like a black slave for his white master. Don King constantly manipulates the topic of slavery in the media, describing the relationship between Bill and Mike. Tyson himself begins to speculate on this topic, clearly imposed by King saying phrases like, the black should work only with the blacks. Arguments are initiated over Mike's contract, salary, and management commissions. Don King shows his double-faced nature by being nice to Robin, pushing her into a confrontation with Bill Clayton. At the same time, he calls Robin a ruthless snake that manipulates Mike by pretending to be pregnant, though she gets confused when it comes to the due date of her fictional pregnancy. Ultimately, after a series of manipulations, Don King becomes Tyson's manager. One evening, Mike arrives home and is told that Robin has had a miscarriage. Tyson is late for training. Kevin speaks out about him being late. Tyson glares at him. Obviously, Mike is depressed and cannot concentrate on the training. Kevin demands for him to get down to work. Mike does not want to continue and leaves the ring. Mike's friend tells Kevin about the miscarriage and says that Mike is having a hard time. Kevin answers, Oh yeah, I feel sorry, all right. Sorry to be the only one with the balls enough to tell him that Robin was about as pregnant as I am. Tyson gets furious after hearing these words and begins to brutally beat his sparring partner. Next, he demands another fighter. Mike gives him a 10-second head start to knock him out. Should he fail, Mike will finish him. After 10 seconds, Tyson begins to destroy the fighter. The third sparring partner hurries to leave the gym. Come on in here, Thanks, but no thanks, homeboy. Look at that. $1,500 a week, Keep the chains, Mr. Tyson. Atlantic City, 1988. Tyson vs. Spinks. The lawyer gives Bill an envelope with documents from which he learns that he's been fired. Mike enters the ring with a record of 34 wins, 30 by knockout. He's fighting for the seventh title. Kevin gives Mike the motivation to fight for Cuss and Jimmy. This is the most significant event of the year, with two undefeated champions meeting in the ring. The cost of tickets reached $1,500. There are many celebrities in the audience, including Chuck Norris, Jack Nicholson, and Sylvester Stallone. Tyson wins the fight by knockout. I saw Tyson beat Sphinx on TV. The audience roars, and everyone rushes to congratulate Mike. Mike and Robin are having a joint interview at Tyson's mansion. Unexpectedly for everyone, Robin talks about the fact that Mike suffers from a manic, depressive psychosis. She says there can hardly be anything worse than living with him. Now she understands all the abused and humiliated women. If he isn't helped, the situation will get even worse. Watching this broadcast in the company of Mike's friend, Don King is completely shocked. They are surprised that Mike's wife can stain his reputation so openly. Brothers, the Lord works in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. After this interview, Mike kicks Robin out of the house along with her mother. I send my apologies to all impressionable people, but I simply have to insert this entire scene. Uh, Ma'am, there was a call. We finally get here. Where the hell have you been? We could have been killed. You don't want. Huh? 
Huh? There was a call about a domestic dispute. Ain't no fucking dispute. Everybody knows they're fucking bitches. Fuck you. Man, this motherfucking house. What the I want? Sir, you can't threaten your wife. Yo, I didn't do shit. I didn't put a hand on her. Oh, my God. Sir, get the out of here. Mr. Tyson, we can't leave with this. Robin files for divorce, accompanying this entire process with frequent interviews. She tells how Mike beat her up regularly. She says that, like a professional, he knew how to beat her with no visible traces left. Robin also speculates on the fact that he threatened to kill her during their fights. Mike begins to spend more and more time in clubs and in public. During one of these evenings near a club, Mike is provoked by Mitch Green, whom Tyson once defeated by unanimous decision. Mitch says that the judges undeservedly gave the victory to Mike. Of course, he uses his chance to make a couple of compliments to his ex-wife, with whom he allegedly had sex at his home that night. Mike's friend wants to take him away. Mike throws a right cross at Green, gets into the car, and drives away. Tokyo, on the eve of the fight with Buster Douglas, Tyson watches flattering interviews with the Japanese, in which the majority of the interviewees pay tribute to Iron Mike. Tyson enters this fight with the new team. Following Don King's advice, Mike fired all the coaches that brought him to his success, including Kevin Rooney. Rooney watches the fight of his former trainee on TV. The fight is led by Douglas. In round eight, Tyson knocks Douglas down, but due to the referee's mistake, the knockdown actually counts 12 seconds instead of 10, and Douglas manages to get up during this time. Don King is outraged because this is the longest countdown he has ever seen. The gong rings, giving Buster extra time to recover. In the 10th round, Mike Tyson is defeated by knockout for the first time in his professional career. In the locker room, Don is trying to prove on the phone that there was a knockout of 15 seconds in the 8th round instead of 10 seconds. He's going to prove it in court. You won the fight, Mike. On my back? The fight was over! I lost. Mike returns home. At home, they drink tea with Camille. Mike looks at the ice cream can and laughs as he remembers Cuss saying to never eat his ice cream. Who ate my ice cream? Don't you never eat my ice cream. In Indianapolis, Mike arrives at the rehearsal of the Miss Black America Beauty Contest. The women are pleasantly surprised by the presence of the star guest. Mike joins the models for a group photo and meets Desiree Washington. In the evening, he calls Desiree and invites her to a party. She agrees and they go to the hotel. Mike says he just needs to pick up his bodyguard. Desiree thinks they're going to a social party with celebrities in the press afterwards, but Mike takes her to his room. A few days later, Mike is taken into custody for rape. The court sentences the ex-champion to six years in prison. This was my recap of the 1995 Tyson movie. I've prepared other reviews for you, and you can see them by clicking on these pictures. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Hugs to all of you. See you soon.